I'm Charlie Goodman, the interim pastor here at Higher Ground Baptist Church. I first want to thank you for taking the time to view this program. We recognize that for some of you that are providentially hindered, you probably view the Higher Ground Baptist Church as your home church. As a result of that, I want to invite you uh, to participate in an act of worship by giving. You can go to higherground.org and you can find a link there if you would like to give to the ministry of Higher Ground. And for those of you that uh, are able to gather in a local body, by no means do we want to take the place of that local fellowship. And if you're in the Tri-Cities area, we'd love to have you at Higher Ground Baptist Church. If you'd like to contribute to the ministry that makes broadcasts like this possible, we invite you as well to go to higherground.org and you can find a link there to give. Again, thank you so much for taking the time to view this program. And if you would be so mindful, you might consider just sending a note of appreciation or a note to let us know who you are and that you watch. That would be a great encouragement to the ministry and staff, especially those that make this program possible. Thank you so much again. May you have a blessed day and enjoy this service of the Higher Ground Baptist Church.
says that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen? Amen. Let's rejoice this morning. Let's get up out of that grave of sin and rejoice. Thank you. 
that day. And, and on that day, when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord.
If you have your Bibles, find with me John's Gospel. John's Gospel, chapter number 7. John's Gospel, chapter number 7. I'm going to make some of you very happy this morning because we're just going to look at three verses of Scripture. Huh. <laughs> three verses of Scripture starting in John's Gospel, chapter 7 and verse number 37. John chapter 7 and verse number 37 on the subject of living water. Or we could, we could call it the blessing of living water, but we, we find that there's, uh, there is a truth of living water that I believe can be a blessing to us that we see out of John's gospel this morning. If you're able to do so, stand with me out of the honor of the reading of God's word. John chapter 7 and verse number 37 on the subject of living water. The Bible says in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Let us pray together this morning. Father, we love you and we praise you. Lord, I thank you for those who are gathered here this day. We thank you for the songs of praise that have been sung. We thank you for the prayers that have been prayed. We thank you for the fellowship that's been enjoyed. And Lord, now as we come to commune at your word, we ask you to feed us. Father, we pray that you would refresh us with your living water. And Father, I ask you that for those that are thirsty, spiritually thirsty, Father, I pray that you would become their living water this day. And Lord, for those that do know you, but maybe they've wandered out of your will, Father, I pray they'd return to you. Lord Jesus, I pray they'd return this day. And Lord, that, that the, the living water that only you provide and only you give, that it would become real and refreshing in their life. And Father, I pray for those this day that are saved and Lord, they're walking with you. And, and Father, they're concerned about doing your will. Father, I pray that this text would come to life in their individual lives. Father, I pray that out of their bellies would flow rivers of living water. And Father, we ask you to accomplish in this place what only you can. That the lost be saved, the wayward come home, the discouraged would find encouragement, the brokenhearted be bound up. Lord, those that are grieving, that they might find peace. And Lord, that you would, you would console them like only you can. But Lord, for a little while, may all things be put out of our mind. May we focus on you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. In John chapter 7, starting in verse number 37, there's a, a little bit of a transition in the text and the pericope or the, uh, the textual paragraph in the Greek is going to, uh, to clue us in on that, that there's something interesting and there's something important and something powerful here. Now there's several things that lead us to that. Uh, we find that first that Jesus is going to be standing uh, when he makes this plea. He's going to cry out, speak in a loud voice. And you may remember that in the days of our Lord, when those who were uh, religious and spiritual teachers, when they taught, they, they did not stand, but rather they would sit down as they would do that. And Jesus is going to stand up. And Jesus is going to, in the midst of this feast, in the midst of this celebration, he's going to remind them of who he is and he's going to extend to them a marvelous invitation. In the context of our passage this morning, understand that this is the Feast of Tabernacles. Or the Feast of Booths, it was sometimes called. It, it would come from the, the Hebrew uh, Sukkah or Sukkot. And, and what would happen is that the, uh, the children of Israel would celebrate God bringing them out of Egypt. And uh, they would celebrate this by a, a week-long celebration where those that were uh, in the more rural areas, they would set up a, a sukkot or a, a, a tent, if you will, outside in their yard. It was just a, a makeshift 
a piece of cloth that was strung among some branches and it would be used as a way to shade them and they would camp out for the week. For those that were in the city, oftentimes their roofs were flat and they would set up their, their, their sukkot or their tent on top of their house and they would spend a week in it. That's always sounded fun to me, being an outdoorsy kind of guy. However, there was also a, a, a solemn parade, if you will, that transpired every day. You see, they would, uh, they would have a procession that would be led by the high priest and they would carry this golden pitcher empty. They would carry it to the pool of Siloam and he would dip it in there and as they were doing this, they would sing a portion of Scripture. They would sing out of Isaiah chapter 12 verses 3 through 6 where there we read this, Therefore with joy... Shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation? Doesn't that sound good? With joy you shall draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day shall you say, Praise the Lord. Call upon His name. Declare His doings among the people. Make mention that His name is exalted. Sing unto the Lord, for He hath done excellent things that is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. So can you picture this? I mean, every day, for seven days, the high priest would lead this procession. They would fill the empty pitcher of water, and also it, it'll help you to understand that, that this celebration came during the dry season for Israel. So this also became a, a kind of a prayer for rain and recognizing the need of, of water. And the high priest would lead them back to the temple and he would go to the altar and he would pour that pitcher of water out as a, as a symbol of God providing for them water out of the rock. And he would pour that out as an act of worship. But on the seventh day, on the seventh day some things were different. On the seventh day, they would go through the entire procession. But when they would get close to the temple, usually someone would give three loud blasts, if you will, from the shofar. And it might have sounded something like this. everyone's attention would be back upon the procession. And then the high priest would, would lead them to the altar and they would march around the altar seven times on this seventh day and they would pour out that pitcher of water. Now, there, there is some debate here on whether this takes place on the seventh day or the eighth day because the Jews had added an eighth day to this celebration but they did not have any procession. There was not any pouring out of water on the eighth day. And I'm convinced this happens on the seventh day. The reason being is because Jesus says in this 37th verse, in the last day, that great day of the feast, it was the seventh day that was the great day. It was the seventh day where they marched around seven times. It was on the seventh day that there's periods of history that tells us not only did they march around the, the, the altar seven times, but there were certain times that they, they uh, uh, did this procession seven times times on that seventh day and now all the water's been poured out Do you, are you tracking with me this morning I mean for seven days they have marched to the pool of Siloam they have poured that water out on the altar but it's not going to happen anymore this year for this celebration that we find our Lord in here and it's at that moment it's at that moment that Jesus is going to stand up and Jesus stands up and he proclaims with a loud voice and he's going to remind us here, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. I want you to see that Jesus offers us an invitation. Aren't you thankful for the invitation of our Lord? I am thankful that he invites us. I'm sure that all of us at some point or another, there's been something that we've not been invited to. You know, you might not always want to go. You might not always want to be a part of it, but it is nice just to be invited, isn't it? 
As a matter of fact, I was talking to a student this past week, and we were talking about his upcoming wedding. And uh, he's telling me where it's at and that sort of thing. And I just asked him, I said, whoa, you mean your invitation doesn't have an address on it? Am I not getting an invitation to your wedding? He said, no, of course you're getting an invitation to my wedding. And just I was just giving him a hard time. About two days later in the, the box outside of my office, there was that wedding invitation. I don't know if I'm going, but it's nice to be invited, isn't it? Do you know that our Lord has invited us? Turn to the person next to you and tell them, say, Jesus has invited you. Now, initially, Jesus invites us to salvation. He, he invites us to the forgiveness of our sin and new life that's found in Him. After that, He invites us to walk with Him. He invites us to grow in Him. He invites us to serve Him and to follow Him. He invites us to some form of ministry. If you've been born again, God's called you to ministry. It may not be vocationally, but God has called you. And He'll use you exactly where you are for His honor, for His glory, and it'll also prove itself to be for your good but notice in the text Jesus has a, a I believe here I think that he's very salvific uh, in his direction and in, in his invitation so what I mean by that I believe his concern is going to be comparing the parchness of the season have you ever been thirsty I mean really really thirsty a number of years ago, I, I read an account from Major Gilbert, who helped to, uh, uh, who's, he was a British major, by the way, and, and his troops had helped to establish Israel as a nation. And, and he describes in his account of that that they, they had pressed on beyond their, their water carriers, which was camels, and that they had been a couple days without any water. He said that the battle was so fierce that they really felt like moment by moment they were fighting for their life. And he, he told about the fact that finally they, they come to a place where there is a cistern. And he said you could hear the water flowing for some time before you got there. He said that he, he understood that unless he got control of the situation, it was going to be a, a madhouse, folks trying to get to the water. So immediately he lined them up in a double line. And he said he announced to everyone there, we're talking thousands of troops, they, they, they sent this word through them and they said, you know, the wounded are going to drink first. Then we'll, we'll let those that, that are on guard, they're going to drink next. And then we'll go company by company. And, and he, he shared how that for some of them, they stood for hours. They stood for hours listening to the water running. They stood for hours waiting for their time to drink at the cistern and, and out of that fresh flowing water and he remarked that, that in all of his time serving that this, this incident stood out because no one was murmuring and no one was complaining but everyone was waiting for their drink. Well, I'm thankful that our Lord, uh, He doesn't have to have a line. I'm thankful that our Lord doesn't have to ration His living water. I am thankful this morning that we can come and we can drink. And the invitation this day for the thirsty soul. Have you ever been thirsty? Have you ever been so thirsty that you didn't know where your next drink was coming from? Have you ever been so thirsty that you were willing to, in essence, drink anything almost, whether it was clean water, fresh water, or whether it was muddy water? Thirst is an interesting thing, isn't it? The Bible tells us that if we hunger and thirst for righteousness in the Beatitudes, we shall be filled. You see, two of the most basic needs in human life is the need for nourishment from food and from water. And Jesus speaks to those here who are thirsty. Not necessarily physically thirsty, but spiritually thirsty. I want you to understand this morning that Jesus can refresh your soul. Jesus can forgive your sin. Jesus can make you new in Him. Jesus can bring purpose to the life that seems purposeless. Jesus is the point, and He can bring uh, His point to the life that maybe seems pointless. We find that He offers us this invitation. 
Notice with me that there's three words in this 37th verse that speak to us about the gospel. I've said this for a while, but only thirsty people drink, only hungry people eat, and only dirty people wash. You see, until we recognize ourselves for who we are, then not much happens. You've heard me share before, but there was three guys going down the road in a pickup truck, and one of them says, hmm, somebody forgot his deodorant. The guy in the middle said, well, it's not me because I don't wear any. <laughs> he didn't understand. He, he, he did not recognize that he had a need to cover up his stink. Are you with me? And for many folks, they do not recognize the answer to the dryness in their life, the answer to the thirstiness of life. Brother Barry testified this morning, talking about his nephew, how he had tried certain things to fulfill that need in man's life. You see, God has created you and I with a God-sized hole in our life. You can cram all sorts of things in that hole. You can cram education. You can cram accomplishment. You can cram possessions. You can cram relationships. All sorts of things you can cram in that hole. But understand me this morning, none of those things will ever satisfy you. You see, it's a God-sized hole. I'm not a jigsaw puzzle kind of guy. Anybody in here like jigsaw puzzles? A few of you, not me. Not me because I'm impatient. You see, I can do the border, and then after I do the border, I want to go through, I want to find a piece and go, mm, 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 right? Rhonda says it won't fit. Oh, yes, it will. Yes, it will. Give me enough time and a pocket knife, I'll make it fit. Amen? It may not look like much when I'm done, but, but it'll fit. And, and that's what we do in our life. We try to cram things in there. But it's a God-sized hole. And Jesus speaks to them on this day, this day of celebration, this day that's full of commemorance, and this day that's full of worship, and this day that's looking to God. And He reminds them, He tells them here, If any man thirst... Remember, I said three words that are important. The word thirst, the word come, and the word drink. You see, until we recognize our thirstiness, until we recognize the need in our heart and in our life, until we admit that, that nothing else is going to satisfy, that nothing else is going to fulfill us, that nothing else is going to anchor us and going to bring in joy to our life, until we're thirsty, friend, we're never going to be willing to drink. The question I'm asking you, asking you this morning is, are you thirsty? It's interesting as we look at the flooding. You understand what a flood is, right? A, a flood is where more water is present than the terrain of the land can carry. And as a result, the waters rise. Everyone in here understands that. But isn't it interesting that in the wake of a flood that the number one thing that any, any place that's experienced flooding, the number one thing they need is water because it disrupts the water system. And, and the, uh, the natural water system becomes undrinkable or unsafe to drink. Now, isn't that interesting? I mean, they're surrounded by water, but without some living water, some fresh water, some clean water, they can perish. I want you to understand that, that we are living in a world that surrounds us with many things that, that looks like it will satisfy the thirst in our life. But Jesus is the living water. And Jesus is reminding these folks here that if any man thirst, so he tells us this offer is available for all of us, if any man thirst, let him come. You see, the, the thirsting promotes us to come. Until you see yourself as, as spiritually in need, spiritually dry, spiritually thirsty, you're never going to come. But now watch this. Not only do we find that he uses the word come, he says, but and drink. Did you know that you can come to Jesus and not drink? Anybody remember the rich young ruler? He was one who came to Jesus he was one who recognized some sort of need in his life. But when Jesus put his parameters before him, he said, uh-uh, that's not for me. And as a result, he goes away grieving. Or, or he, he leaves Jesus, not positively, but he leaves Jesus negatively. You see, the invitation this morning is that for those who are thirsty, 
For those who are dry, are we not often dry as Baptists? I can talk about it because I am one, but as Baptists, we're often dry. Someone said, uh, talking about temperature, should the church be hot or should the church be cold? Ronnie Jones said, let it be hot because it's usually cold enough. Hmm? Amen. But he says, those who are thirsty, let them come. And then what happens after they come into him? Drink. Drink. Do you understand that, that you, can, you can come, you can come to a place like this, you can come to a corporate gathering, you can come to public worship and never drink from the living water? You see, it's not your name on a church pew that's going to allow you to go to heaven. It's not about what you've done, what your mommy and daddy have done. It's not about what anyone's done. The question is, have you drunk from the source of living water? Now, don't miss this. The, these folks have been involved in a religious ceremony. Do you see it? I mean, it's the feast of booths and tabernacle. They've been doing these religious things. They've sung religious songs. They've, they've sung, the, sung the text. they sung uh, Isaiah 12, 3 through 6. But Jesus says, if any man is thirsty, let him come and drink. Reminds me of Revelation 22 and verse 17. The Bible says there in the Spirit, and the bride say come and let him that heareth say come and let him that is at thirst come and whosoever will let him take freely of the water of life or take the water of life freely depending on your translation there do you notice that there is an invitation for us to nourish and refresh our parched soul there is an invitation for us to find that life-giving water that's in Jesus. But Jesus is not done yet. Not only does Jesus offer for us an invitation, notice secondly in verse 38, He offers some inspiration. I know some of you said, now wait a minute preacher, that's, that, that first part of that sermon, that's way too evangelistic. I've been saved, I know I'm saved. So some of you have already turned me off. This message is not for me. Oh, not so fast. This message is for you. Look what the Bible says in verse 38. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now again, we find for those of you that are students of the Bible, there's some debate here about how we should translate this. And I'll just tell you, if you have an NLT, it translates it wrong according to my understanding of the Greek language. There's a clause here. And, and this clause can be applied one of two ways. The question is, where does this water, uh, where does it flow out of? Does it flow from the, the, the middle, from the belly of the believer? Or does it flow from the, the heart of Jesus, as the NLT is going to translate it there? Well, see, without question, the Bible communicates to us that, that this living water, it originates with Holy God. He, he pours it into us. But the clause here, I believe, in the context of the Scripture is communicating to us that those who are believers, that out of the midst of who they are, out of their bellies, the, the centermost part of who we are should flow rivers of living water. It's an allusion back to Psalm 78, verses 15 and 16, as well as a number of other biblical passages. You see, God has called us, when we drink of the living water, not to build a pond. Do you know what a pond is? A pond is stagnant water, right? Now, I understand there can be some flow if you have a spring-fed pond, maybe, but the, the, the pond is encapsulated. That's what we do in our Christian life. Preacher, I've been saved. I've been born again. I've got my get out of hell free card. I don't want anything to do with the church, or anything to do with the Bible. By the way, I'm not sure you ever got saved, but that's, that's a whole other message for a whole other time. But we, we dam off this water and we create this pond. And you know what we do? We become stagnant. How many of you have known mean people that sit on church pews? Huh? Hateful disgruntled, mad at everything. Jeremiah talked about them. Jeremiah said they can't see when good comes. You know why? Because they're a stagnant pond. You know what a stagnant pond does? It, it gets a, a level of, uh, of like sledge over. You know what I'm talking about? 
especially growing up like I did, fishing in ponds, cattle ponds. You know what happens in cattle ponds? Mm-hmm. More than once, I've cut me a limb out of a cedar tree and used it just to brush off the top of the water so I could fish that little hole. Can I tell you that, that it's symbolic of where we are? You see, uh, there's some of us this morning that, that there's a level of sledge over our, our spiritual pond, if you will, and what we need is God the Holy Spirit to, to brush off all that junk, and, and we need the backhoe of the Holy Ghost to tear out that dam so that we might flow rivers of living water. One of the reasons that the church in America seems to be so out of touch and seems to be so anemic in our day is the fact that we don't live out what we say we believe. And the, the fact that, that our, our testimony and, and the text doesn't seem to match up, the, the testimony of our walk. But notice he, he tells us here that he who believeth on him, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. It is flowing because God is not stagnant. God is not torment. And, and God wants us to be flowing with his truth. You see, a little dab of this won't do you. I tell students all the time, if God's called you to ministry, it's a call to prepare. You know, they say, well, I, I really don't like reading, or I don't like doing these pay. I don't like that. Then listen, you're going to have a hard time if God's called you to teach and preach His Word. Because it is a lifetime of preparing. And might I also say to a congregation like this, when God moves in your life, and when you're born again, when you're transformed, we find that a little dab of Him will not do you, because what happens is we become stagnant, diseased, slimy, grotesque. What does stagnant water do? It smells, doesn't it? Do, do you get the picture here? He says that, that rivers of living water are going to flow out of us. John chapter 4 and verse 14, Jesus said it this way. You'll remember this text well. Jesus said, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give, him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be, in, shall be in him. All right, are you with me? The water I shall give him shall be in him. A well of water springing up, springing up into everlasting life. Those of you that know me, some of you don't. I, I'm not. I, I've never been a preacher that tried to make folks doubt. I, I've never used a, a motion this word's too important for that. And those who do those things, one day after a while, you'll stand before a holy God and have to answer for it. But you hear me this morning. You say, preacher, I signed a card. I walked an aisle. I, I was dunked in it. But nothing's ever happened. Listen, that's not biblical salvation. He tells us here this springs forth into eternal life. That means that there's been a disruption in the soul and in the spirit and in the person. The disruption is, is that those who we were, that who we was, has been replaced by who we are in Jesus Christ. Jesus inspires us and he reminds us that some things should be flowing through us. We're a conduit. You know what a conduit is? A conduit is something that something else runs through. You, you can't dam up. You, you can't fill your bottle and put the lid on it because God calls us to be perpetually pouring out our life. And by the way, might I say to you, Sunday school teacher, might I say to you, preacher, might I say to you, whomever, you cannot pour out what God has not poured in. So it, the Christian life is a perpetual emptying and filling, emptying and filling, emptying and filling. But notice here, notice lastly, and then we'll move to a time of invitation this morning. Notice that not only does Jesus give us an invitation in this text, does he provide some inspiration, I think, for the Christian life, but then thirdly, he, uh, the, the text gives us some information. The text gives us some information about what's going on here chronologically. Notice what the text says. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Just be sure you don't misunderstand. 
The text is not saying that the Holy Spirit didn't exist. The text is not saying that the Holy Spirit wasn't active. But what the text is saying is that at this point in time, believers did not receive the the perpetual, the universal, the absolute indwelling of the Holy Spirit at this time. That happened at the day of Pentecost. So uh, before the day of Pentecost, God the Holy Spirit would set up on a believer and then he would move. He he would be there and then he would move. He's, He's always there. He's God. Don't misunderstand this. But listen to me. You and I, we're living on the other side of Pentecost. Amen? And at the day of Pentecost, we find that God the Holy Spirit took up residence in believers. And from that point forward, we find that those who are born again, they are endowed. They, They are indwelled by God the Holy Spirit. Jesus said it this way in his promise, John 14, verses 16 and 18. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because they seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless I will come to you. Jesus promises us there that the paraclete, the the helper, God the Holy Spirit, that he will take up residence within us. And in essence, Jesus says, I'm sending you one just like me. We find that God the Holy Spirit indwells believers. And it's through the work of God the Holy Spirit that we can see this passage come to life, that out of our life will flow rivers of living water. So here's my question this morning, twofold. One, are you thirsty? Are you thirsty this morning? Because only Jesus will satisfy. Are you listening to me? Only Jesus will satisfy. Nothing else. Nothing else. Here's question number two. How's your spiritual life? Are you the dam? The pond? Stagnant, stale, stinky, full of sludge? Or are you fulfilling this text that out of your bellies flowing rivers of living, life, living water? This morning, I can tell you what I want to be. This morning, I want to be a vessel that God uses. This morning, I want to be a vessel that God's power and God's presence flows through. This morning, I want to be a, a source of living water like the text says here. Now, I can't be a source because it originates with me. Don't misunderstand the text. It originates with Him. But He pours it into us. And as He pours it into us, He pours it out of us as well. That's God's model. By the way, we find that model is not only in spiritual things. It's in all things in the life of the church. We, we pour out and God feels. We pour out and God feels. We pour out and God feels. You just start hoarding. You start hoarding anything in the spiritual life. I'll tell you what will happen. You become stagnant. You'll start trusting things, and you'll start distrusting people. Just just watch. It It happens time after time after time. God's called us to be indwelled by Him. And out of our bellies, the, the center of our life is what He's saying there, should flow rivers of living water. That's the question. Number one, are you spiritually thirsty? If you are, He said, come and drink. Secondly, where are you spiritually? Are you the pond or are you the living water? Let's pray together this morning. Every head bowed and every eye closed. How many of you would slip your hand up this morning and say, Preacher, God spoke to me through His Word. Amen. There's, there's hands up all over the house this morning. In what way has He spoken to you? Has He spoken into you that that the need for your thirsty soul is only found in a salvific experience and a spiritual relationship with Him? Has He spoken to you in such a way that convicted you of the spiritual stagnation you're experiencing in your life? If that's you, either of those categories, I ask you this day, Don't put it off. Would you come? Would you come right now? Would you come right now? Jesus stood up in this text and he cried with a loud voice. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink.
preach redemption to a lost and dying.